Well, now it's time to introduce our speaker. I was just really uh, moved when I first talked to Dr. Larry McCall about his heart uh, for grandparenting and then began to read his book. Uh, um, and again, realized how much more we all can have to learn and us in particular. So Larry, if you wanna go ahead and uh, unmute your audio and your video and come on up on the screen and we will look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Barb. And it's good to be with you all here on Grand Monday Night. Here's a heart searching question. Imagine that you have passed away and the day will come for each of us. And the pastor presiding at your funeral asks your now adult grandchildren to give a testimony of the impact you have had on their lives. What will your grandchildren say at your memorial service? May I ask you, what do you hope they will say? Two of my fellow pastors and I had the privilege of presiding at the funeral of a godly lady in our church who had passed away at the age of 80. And we asked some of the family members if they would like to share testimonies of the impact that grandma had had on their lives. And several of them shared wonderful stories. I noticed that even though they had tears on their cheeks, they had smiles on their faces. But there was one testimony of a granddaughter in her 20s that especially caught my attention. This gal looked at the first couple of rows that was filled with her siblings and her cousins. And she said, Grandma sure loved us, didn't she? But you know what? She loved Jesus even more. And when she said that, I found myself crying. And I thought, what a precious legacy to leave to your children and your grandchildren, that you love Jesus more than anyone else, even your much loved grandchildren. But then as I sat there, I began to reflect on my own life as a grandfather. And I was quietly asking myself, would my grandchildren be able to say something like that at my funeral? Would they be able to say with integrity, Papa, sure loved us, didn't he? But he loved Jesus even more. And as I reflected on that question, I began to wonder what would have to happen for that to be true in my life. That my grandchildren would be growing up with this clear understanding that Papa loves Jesus more than anything else, more than everyone else. That Jesus is the prime object of his affection. You know, sometimes the Bible pictures a Christian life as a race. I like to think of it as a relay race. And each of us is running our lap. Somewhere back along the line, if we're Christian, somewhere back along the line, someone passed that gospel baton into our hands. And then now we're running our race as Christians. And the Bible's clear that we need to hold tightly to that baton of the gospel. We don't want to drop it. We don't want to carelessly throw it away or let someone grab it out of our hands. We're to hold fast to the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the gospel. But we also are required to pass that baton on, that we are to pass the baton on to the next generation, even as someone handed it to us at one point. Who was it that passed the baton on to you? Was it one of your parents? Maybe one of your grandparents. I'm guessing that for many of us on this webinar that it was a family member who shared the gospel with us at some point. But how do we pass the baton on to our grandchildren? How do we inspire them to follow Jesus Christ? That gospel baton requires words. It is necessary for us to use words to teach our grandchildren the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's not just what we say that our grandchildren are going to remember. It's what we're passionate about. You remember what your grandparents were passionate about. What are our grandchildren going to remember about us? Now, obviously, I can't do this, but what if I could interview your grandchildren? And I were to ask them, what is your grandfather, what is your grandmother passionate about? What charges his or her batteries? What would your grandchildren say to that? What would they say that grandpa, grandma 
is passionate about. That's what they're going to remember. And so this evening on Grand Monday Night, what we want to talk about this evening is this. We want to search God's Word for an answer to this question. How do we leave a contagious, Christ-centered legacy for our grandchildren? Well, it involves the power of a, power of a godly example, doesn't it? There's great power in examples. There's a proverb that Jesus spoke. You know, often we think of Jesus read, speaking in parables, and he did. But occasionally, Jesus would use a proverb. And one time, he was talking to his followers, and he said this. And I'm quoting now from Luke chapter 6, verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now, let me read that last phrase again. Everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now, when we hear the word teacher in our Western culture, our modern Western culture, what image comes to our mind? Rows of desks and a teacher up front. But when Jesus spoke that proverb, he wasn't describing rows of desks with a teacher up front. He was using what we would call a rabbinic model. He was calling people to follow a rabbi, a, a teacher that would walk around teaching his mentees even as he did life with them. Remember when Jesus was up on the North Shore of Galilee and he said to those fishermen, come follow me? That was a rabbinic invitation. He was saying to these fishermen, come do life with me, walk with me, listen to what I say. Watch what I do. Ask me questions. He was inviting these men to be discipled by him, or we would say in our modern English, mentored by him. Now, think of Jesus' proverb. Every student, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher, his mentor. How does that relate to our ministry of grandparenting? It's a sobering question. Basically, what it's meaning is this. As we spend time with our grandchildren, at least to some degree, we're going to rub off on them. That in some ways, our grandchildren will begin to reflect us. They will, to some degree, become like us. You think about things we prioritize in life. Is our grandchildren spend time with us and watch us and listen to us, hear what we're passionate about? Our priorities, to some degree, will become their priorities. Our passions will become their passions. Our perspectives on life will become their perspectives. Isn't that sobering to think, in some measure, our grandchildren in the Lord's normal providence will begin to look like us? If that's true, and it is in a general way, then we need to give serious thought to what kind of legacy we're leaving to the coming generations. There are several places in the Bible where uh, the Spirit of God draws our attention to the power of a legacy of life, especially intergenerationally. You know, in the Christian grandparenting movement, in the intentional Christian grandparenting movement, I think one verse a lot of people like to remember is 2 Timothy 1.5. In this last letter to his son in the faith, Paul wrote to Timothy from a prison cell in Rome. He said, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. And the Apostle Paul, as he writes this last letter to this young man who had become a son to him, a son in the faith, he said, Timothy, I remember and I want you to remember the spiritual legacy God gave you in his kindness, in his grace. That your grandmother, your mother, modeled for you a faith in Jesus Christ. And I know by God's grace, that's true in your life as well. And then just a little bit later in that same letter, Paul said something that gets easily missed. He said, I'm reminded of your sincere faith. But then later in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, he says, continue in that. 
let me read. It says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, listen, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And as Paul has this last word to his son in the faith, he says, Timothy, I want you to remember what you heard, but I also want you to remember from whom you heard it. Remember not only what they taught you about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but remember how they modeled it. Remember from whom you heard it, your grandmother, your mother, and yes, me as your spiritual mentor. So if we're going to leave that kind of Christ-reflecting legacy, if we're going to leave a legacy to our grandchildren to point them to Christ, what does that look like? What does it look like to leave that kind of spiritual legacy? Well, it involves having a personal godliness in our lives as the older generation, that we're modeling for the coming generations a godly example. Now, I know that we all feel our inadequacies, and there's a good reason why we feel our inadequacies, because we are. <laughs> you and I are inadequate in so many ways. Aren't you thankful that Christ is adequate when we are inadequate? <laughs> we feel so ordinary at times, don't we? You know, when we think about godly examples, we think of somehow those super spiritual people in Bible times or even in church history who we're just exemplary in powerful ways. And we feel like, well, I don't have the same thing to offer. And yet, we realize that our grandchildren are going to not only listen to our words, they're going to watch our lives. And it's probably going to be how we live that'll stick, maybe even more firmly than the words we gave them. So how do we model a godly, Christ-centered life? If you have a Bible handy, or if you want to put on your phone, Titus chapter 2. I'm going to read a little bit in Titus 2. And if you don't have a Bible handy, that's fine. I'll read it out loud to you. But I'm going to pause now and then. Listen to how Paul begins chapter 2 of Titus. He says, but as for you, Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Teach what accords sound doctrine. Or we might say in our vernacular, what's according to sound doctrine. He's teaching the gospel. He says, Titus, teach people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just initially to get saved, but for everyday life. I don't know how many times I read Titus and I missed this. But Paul tells Titus, as you as a pastor go about the churches on the island of Crete, teach sound doctrine, but then show the people on Crete what difference that makes in everyday life. Show them, Titus teach them how the gospel in ordinary people leads them to live an extraordinary life. Did you ever see that context? When I start reading what follows, you're going to say, oh, I've heard those verses. Older men are to be sober-minded. That's us guys. We are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, sound in love, sound in steadfastness. Older women, and by the way, ladies, that's an, an title of honor, don't be embarrassed. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Do you see what the Holy Spirit's doing here through the Apostle Paul? He says, Titus, in the church, teach people sound doctrine, but then show them what difference it makes. Show them the effectiveness of the gospel in ordinary life, that ordinary people can lead godly lives. Is it a young man? Is it an older man? Is it an older woman? Is it a younger woman? In this season of life that they're in, they can reflect Christ. They can have a godliness to their life that makes the gospel attractive to the coming generations, we would say. So how's that happen, friends? Is this a, well, just do it situation? Or is this one of those situations where you think, well, I need some more rules in my life. I need some way to make myself more godly. <laughs>
Friends, that's not how godliness happens. Did you notice a connecting word in verse 11? Some of you have your Bibles open. There's a little word that begins for verse 11 of chapter 2. It's important. That word is the word for. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Listen, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You know, if we approach the Christian life, even as older people, if we approach the Christian life as, I'm just going to try harder. I'm just going to put some new rules in my life so I can live a more godly life. That usually leads to one of two problems. And interestingly, they're their opposite ends of the spectrum. Sometimes if we try to be godly just by putting more rules in our lives, just do it attitude, we end up very proud. Look at me. I'm better than a lot of people I know. I'm more holy than a lot of people I know. Usually that doesn't last very long. And we end up swinging to the opposite end of the spectrum and we feel like I'm such a failure. I can't pull this off. I'm not a good God example. And, and we feel so defeated. The Christian life a godly Christian life that we want to model for the coming generations doesn't happen just by a, you know, I'm going to have more rules. I'm going to just try harder attitude. It's the grace of God. That's what Paul says in verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared that trains us to say no to ungodliness, to worldly passions, and to say yes to godliness, to modeling Christ in this sinful world that we live in. The gospel is useful not only to get us saved, not only for initial salvation, but the gospel enables us, empowers us to live in an increasingly Christ-reflecting way in our ordinary lives, in our <coughs> ordinary lives at this season of our lives. So I want to encourage you, fellow Christian grandparents, to own the responsibility of not only using our words to teach our grandchildren the gospel, but then show them the effectiveness of the gospel by how we live. We'll show them that the gospel makes a difference in the lives of ordinary people like your grandpa, like your grandma. Look, grandson, look, granddaughter, at the power of the gospel. So you and I need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day, as our old friend Jerry Bridges used to say, preach the gospel to yourself every day. If this godly example that we have is going to have an effectiveness in the lives of our grandchildren, there also needs to be coupled with that godliness, a passion for Christ, a contagious passion for Christ. Do you remember what Paul said, one of his shorter testimonies? He said, it's recorded in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. I know some of you have it memorized. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he wrote that from one of his times in prison. It's for me to live for Christ, is Christ and to die is gain. A little bit later in that same letter to the Philippians, he gave this testimony. Whatever gain I had, I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost for the surpassing greatness of, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. I, I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Is that the kind of testimony our grandchildren can not only hear from us, but see us living out. One of the shorter parables Jesus told was the parable of the treasure in the field. My wife and I are reading that in our devotions just recently in the morning. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field now, we don't have time this evening to explain the background in detail to that parable, but obviously this was some sort of tenant farmer who found a long forgotten, unclaimed treasure buried in a field. But since it wasn't his field, he knew he would have to go buy it. He'd buy the field to gain that treasure. But he knew that treasure was worth more than everything else he had. Can you imagine this man going home to his wife and says, honey, we're having the mother of all yard sales. We're going to get rid of it all. 
It's like, whoa, honey, what's going on here? Uh, trust me. I have found a treasure that's worth more than, not just worth more than anything else we own. It's worth more than everything else we own. We're going to get rid of it all so that we have the resources to get this treasure. Jesus said he did that with joy. Jesus said, that's what my kingdom's like. And so when we think as older Christians, what is the demeanor of our life? Is there a passion for Christ that our grandchildren not only hear from us, but see in us? That we say, Jesus Christ is precious to me. He is my delight. He is my joy. He is worth more to me than anything else. He is worth more to me than everything else in this world. You know, you might be listening to me right now and you're thinking, you know what, Larry? I don't feel it. I don't feel it. I don't see that in my life. I don't see a passion in my life like that that would be contagious. Leading my grandchildren by God's grace to lean in and say, I want what grandpa has. I want what grandma has. I don't see it in my life. How, how do we gain a passion for Christ? Well, there's lots of avenues we could go down, friends, but let me just give you several things to consider. One is the necessity of humility. Did you know one of the most repeated verses in the Bible is God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble? We want his grace, don't we? We need his grace. And the Holy Spirit reminds us several times in the Bible that God gives grace to the humble so that we humble ourselves. We come to him as needy people, not deserving people, as needy people. Lord, come and stir my heart. And so in humility, then, we ask the Holy Spirit. We ask the Holy Spirit. And I do this myself when I find the fires dying low. As I think about how the Holy Spirit saved me, he gave me eyes to see. He gave me ears to hear. He took out my heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh that loves Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. He said, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give us, listen, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So in humility, we come, we say, Holy Spirit, remind me of Jesus Christ. Show me Jesus Christ that I would see the glory of God in the face of Jesus, that I would find Jesus to be beautiful. I would find Jesus valuable. And so we humble ourselves, we ask, and then we read. We read in our Bibles looking for Jesus. What part of the Bible is about Jesus? I, I think you know the answer to that, don't you? It all is. The whole Bible is about Jesus. Do you remember that precious story? I think Luke records it in Luke chapter 24 about the two on the way to Emmaus. How the night of the resurrection, those two disciples were so discouraged. They knew Jesus had died and there were rumors of him rising again, but they weren't convinced that he did. And, and Jesus, it says he started in Moses and the prophets and explained that it all pertained to him. Moses, you know what that would be, don't you? That'd be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Starting in Genesis and all through the prophets, yeah, probably the whole way through Malachi. He showed these two that the whole Bible that they had, the Old Testament, was all about Jesus. And they said later, didn't our hearts burn within us? That we read our Bibles, whether we're reading in Jeremiah or the Gospel of Mark or the book of Philippians, and we want to see Christ in some ways. Not to force him into the text, but to see our need for him, to re be reminded of his character, his grace. Now, you don't have to do what I do, but a lot of times when I open my Bible, to have my devotions in the morning, I pause just briefly. And then I say, Holy Spirit, show me Christ today. Show me Christ today. And do you realize that you don't have to twist the Holy Spirit's arm when you pray that? He wants to honor Jesus Christ. He wants Jesus Christ to be honored in your life. And so if you have found the embers dying down in your heart, you're saying, Larry, I don't see it. I don't see a passion for Christ in my life. I want to I feed you hope. 
that the Holy Spirit wants Christ to be honored in your life. He wants you to have a passion for Christ. And so if you humble yourself and you ask, and then you read your Bible looking for Christ, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if you feel the Holy Spirit poking those embers, and pretty soon there's some flames, and, and pretty soon there's a growing flame in your life where you say, oh, Christ is precious to me. Our grandchildren, if they are going to lean in and say, I want what you have, it would be so helpful if they not only heard words from us, but they saw the effectiveness of the gospel in our lives, producing a Christ-reflecting godliness, having a passion for Christ. But you know, if, even if we have a passionate, godly life, if our grandchildren don't get to see that, it's not going to have a lot of effect on them personally. And so I want to also talk to you for a few minutes about the power of with. Yeah, you heard me right. The power of with. To have a contagious, passionate, Christ-centered legacy, we need to spend intentional, meaningful time with our grandchildren. In the last 150 years, there has been a growing bifurcation of the generations. Uh, there's been a movement away from intergenerational impact. And those in the Christian grandparenting movement, I think, are on the forefront of a movement to um, change that. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, generations have been increasingly separated, at first out of necessity, and now by preference. The generations tend to hang with their own kind. Young people hang with young people. Old people hang with old people. But so often in the Bible, we see Psalm 78, Psalm 145, so many places we see this call to intergenerational impact. That we as grandparents need to spend time with our grandchildren so that they can hear the gospel and so they can see the gospel's effect in the lives of an ordinary person, grandpa. Grandma, you can think in the Bible of different times people were noted to have been with. And I think of uh, those disciples who were arrested who seemed to have uh, so little advantage uh, academically. And the Sanhedrin, as they interviewed them, realized that these are just ordinary men. These are fishermen. You know, these are just common, ordinary men, but they speak with such power. And this powerful, educated group, the Sanhedrin, commented among themselves, these men have been with Jesus. We need to be with Jesus, but then we need to be with our grandchildren to pass that on. And as we're with our grandchildren, living the gospel in front of them, before them, we need to do that openly, without facades. I think sometimes as older folks, we're fearful that if our grandchildren see us as struggling in some way or maybe even dealing with sin in our lives, that we need to cover that up. We need to keep that from the grandkids so we don't discourage them. No, I realize there's age appropriateness, but I think our grandchildren need to see um, a transparency in us as older Christians, that we too are in this era between the gardens we also are living in this fallen world, and we struggle, we sin, and they need to see how the gospel helps us deal with that. My wife and I enjoy the delight of having a, a video Bible study with two of our grandchildren every week who live in another state. Some of our grandchildren are local, and some live in another state, and we don't want to lose that intentional pouring into the lives of the ones who don't live near us. And the parents, our daughter and son-in-law, have been so kind to let us now for about two years to have a weekly Bible study with their two older kids. They're old enough to read. And um, we have a tradition with these two kids. We meet them individually, half hour with the one and a half an hour with the other. But as we meet with them online, we always begin with, how can I pray for you, sweetheart? How can I pray for you, buddy? But then they know, they can ask Papa and Grandma, how can I pray for you, Papa? How can I pray for you, Grandma? And we've tried to develop a habit of not manufacturing anything, but if we're struggling with something, if I've been short with their grandma, to say, you know, pray for me as a husband, 
Um, I have not been as loving to your grandma this last week as I want to be, as Christ wants me to be. Pray that I'm a, a more godly husband to your grandma this week. And to hear them pray for Papa that way, as they hear me confessing sin and weaknesses and teaching them the gospel helps me deal with my sin and weaknesses or modeling that for the grandchildren. So it's the power of with. But when I say that, I'm not talking about putting up some sort of idealistic facade, but to live transparently. There's, there's a safety in the gospel that way. And so as we live in front of our grandchildren, as we wrap up here, let me just give some ideas of ways we can model a passion for Christ in front of our grandchildren. Think about opportunities to worship with your grandchildren. Do they see you as being passionate in your worship? Or are you maybe distracted or not singing? How about just even praying with your grandchildren? Do they hear you praying heartfelt prayers? And not just superficial things, but, but eternal sort of prayer requests for people's souls or, or dealing with the glory of God in our world. Do they see you reading the Bible? Do you say, hey, can I share with you something I read this morning? This is precious. Do they see you as serving God by serving his people? Or do they see you as just serving yourself that in your older years have given yourself over to, to a self-centered life? Do, do they see us as being generous with our stuff and our money? Do we say, Christ is so precious to me. I don't need all this stuff. I'm glad to share it, to give him honor, to give him glory. Do they see us suffering well? Are we complainers or do we use our suffering as a means of growing in Christ's likeness, of, of mirroring faith in him? And when the day comes when it's our turn to die, are they going to watch us die well? Are they going to watch us die if the Lord so allows us to be conscious at that point, in a sense, with a smile on our face, that we would look to any family members that are gathered around us and that we would say, sons, daughters, grandsons, granddaughters, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We want to leave a contagious Christ-centered legacy for our grandchildren. It's going to mean that we not only speak the gospel, but we show the gospel to our grandchildren. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, may your spirit make that true in our lives, that we would live in such a way that your son is honored and that our grandchildren are benefited. Holy Spirit, come and have your way with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, friends.